This world is the will to power and nothing besides. And even you yourselves are this will to power and nothing besides. Hello there, everyone, and welcome to this very last episode in the Nietzsche series. Today, we're going to discuss Nietzsche's most contentious idea, the will to power. First off, there is a book entitled The Will to Power, but many people would discard this book as being bad because it is just a bunch of random texts all written by Nietzsche, but chosen and arranged by his sister Elizabeth, who at the time was flirting with the National Socialist Party in Germany. And most of these texts also come from the time of Nietzsche's madness. But the way I look at it is that so many people are trying to discard the idea of the will to power in order to save Nietzsche from fascism and cherry pick from his vast scope of ideas. And to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure you can. Well, yeah, sure, these texts may just be notes from a madman. But the concept of the will to power exists in many other of Nietzsche's books. Here's just a few examples. Wherever I found a living thing, there found I will to power. And even in the will of the servant found I the will to be master. All psychology has hitherto remained anchored to moral prejudices and timidities. It has not ventured into the depths to conceive it as morphology and the development theory of the will to power as I conceive it. The individual can, in conditions preceding the organized state, treat others harshly and cruel to intimidate them, to secure his existence through such intimidations, demonstrations of his power. So let us investigate this concept of the will to power, shall we? First off, we need to acknowledge that Nietzsche didn't write in a typical philosophical style where definitions are very important. Nietzsche liked to play around with words and their meaning. So what did he really mean with the will to power? I think we actually should begin with going back to good old Immanuel Kant who actually laid down the groundwork for the concept of the will. The faculty of desire in accordance with concepts, in so far as the ground determining it to action lies within itself and not in its object, is called a faculty to do or to refrain from doing as one pleases insofar as it is joined with one's consciousness of the ability to bring about its object by one's action, it is called choice, willkür. If it is not joined with this consciousness, its act is called a wish. The faculty of desire whose inner determining ground, hence even what pleases it, lies within the subject's reason is called the will, wille. The will is therefore the faculty of desire considered not so much in relation to action as choice is, but rather in relation to the ground determining choice in action. The will itself, strictly speaking, has no determining ground, in so far as it can determine choice, it is instead practical reason itself. 
insofar as reason can determine the faculty of desire as such. Not only choice but also mere wish can be included under the will. That choice can be determined by pure reason is called free choice. That which can be determined only by inclination, sensible impulses, stimulus, would be animal choice, arbitrum brutum. Human choice, however, is a choice that can indeed be affected but not determined by impulses, and is therefore of itself, apart from an acquired proficiency of reason, not pure but can still be determined to actions by pure will. So the will is the determining factor of an action. The philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, who influenced Nietzsche a great deal, he saw it that the fundamental drive of everything in the world was the will to life, or der Wille zur Leben. So everything is just striving to preserve itself. It certainly has a Darwinian flavor to it, don't you think? But for Nietzsche, the will to life does not incorporate all drives in men or the rest of the world for that matter. For if the will to live is the fundamental drive, suicide or sacrificing one's own self for something greater wouldn't make any sense. So here Nietzsche rather suggests the will to power. He saw it that every organic being had the fundamental drive of the will to power. Physiologists should think again before postulating the drive to self-preservation as the cardinal drive in an organic being. A living thing desires above all to vent its strength. Life as such is will to power. Self-preservation is only one of the indirect and most frequent consequences of it. In short, here as everywhere, beware of superfluous teleological principles. What Nietzsche was interested in was to re-evaluate all values that the Western man had received from Christianity. And according to Friedrich, all these values come from no other than Plato himself. And if something would be able to take its place, it had to be a proper antithesis to what had been. Nietzsche saw himself as the great antagonist of Plato. As I discussed in the episode about metaphysics, Plato thought that there existed an eternal world of forms. In Plato's book, The Republic, Socrates describes the form of the good. So Plato believed there was such a thing as an objective goodness in the world that everyone should strive for, and the best way was through knowledge. So if Christianity was based upon a platonic worldview of an objective goodness, then Nietzsche sought to find the very opposite of that, which is the will to power. The time is coming when we shall have to pay for having been Christians for 2,000 years. We have lost the essential thing on which our lives depend. For a long while we will not know what to do with ourselves. We are rushing headlong towards the opposite values with the same amount of energy which we have been Christians, with which we have embraced senselessly exaggerated Christian values. We attempt some kind of secular solution which retains the same meaning as the Christian one, a solution which truth, 
love and justice, i.e. the socialists, triumph in the end, the equality of persons. We likewise try to cling to the moral ideal which I've preceded to altruism, self-sacrifice and denial of the will. We even try to cling to a beyond, albeit only as an unknown postulated in defiance of all logic. But it is immediately decked out in such a way that some good old-fashioned metaphysical comfort might derive from it. So everything in the world is the will to power and nothing besides. Well, does that mean that friendship and love doesn't exist? I mean, since everybody's just looking out for themselves. I would say no to that. But unconditional love, on the other hand, simply doesn't exist. And it could be devastating for you if you believe it does. Because that means you will take other people's love for granted. If you want to be loved, you need to give them a reason to love you. What Nietzsche was interested in was to find one fundamental drive that characterizes all human activities. So I myself think that the English word power might sometime be a little bit misleading. In German, the expression goes der Wille zur Macht. And the word Macht is very close, closely related to the word Mache, which means to make or to do. So is really the word power a good translation of the word Macht? What do you think? One of the reasons why the will to power is such a contentious idea is because it was used as a slogan in a propaganda movie by Leni Riefenstahl. Triumph des Willens, or the triumph of the will. And the movie was commissioned by Adolf Hitler. And as you remember, Nietzsche's sister invited Hitler to their home after his death. Although I would still very much like to point out that Nietzsche probably wouldn't have liked Nazism. It was socialism for one, and as we discussed in the last episode, Nietzsche didn't like any type of collectivistic ideology, and Nazism surely was that. And maybe that's how you save Nietzsche from fascism. The will to power should only be applied to individuals. The moment it applies to the many, disaster is inevitable. So why are we discussing this concept of the will to power and why is it important? Well, if you remember, an important factor of the Overman and the Dionysian is accepting and affirming life and the world as it is, unfiltered. And in order to do so, one has to know what the world is. And to Nietzsche, the world is the will to power, and you should affirm it even if you don't like it. This is also why the concept of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger is so important for Nietzsche. Because if everything is a struggle to the top and being able to vent one's own strength, then one should aim at becoming the strongest, strongest possible version of oneself through hardship and struggle and suffering.
One thing struck me when I was contemplating this idea of the will to power through struggle is that wars become necessary in order for the human race to advance and become stronger. World peace just doesn't become desirable through this worldview. As horrible as it may sound, think of all the advancement in science that has come out of wars. Take the horrific atomic bomb, killed millions, but maybe without it, the discovery of atomic energy would have come much, much later in human history. Okay, let's hypothetically say that all of a sudden, the whole of humanity just say to each other, all right, let's put down our weapons, get along and love each other. That would just be great, wouldn't it? And then a couple of years later, an alien race invades Earth with weapons. Bye bye, mankind. And also, now mankind is at a precipice of the catastrophes of climate change. And probably the only thing that might be able to save us is through scientific advancement. Hypothetically, even if we would stop emitting any type of gas into the atmosphere at this very moment, we will still have to suffer huge consequences due to climate change. But maybe the suffering will make us stronger. Or will die. But what about altruism and selfless deeds like giving money to the poor or helping an old lady across the street? Well, Nietzsche would say that they are still doing those deeds for selfish reasons. Maybe they want to be seen as good people. The neighbor praises selflessness because it brings him advantages. If the neighbor himself were selfless in his thinking, he would repudiate this diminution of strength, this mutilation for his benefit. He would work against the development of such inclinations. And above all, he would manifest his selflessness by not calling it good. Well, at least for me, the concept of the will to power is a very good tool for analyzing the world, people, and especially conflicts. If you're analyzing a conflict through a Christian worldview, you're usually seeing it through a, a lens of good versus evil, heaven versus hell. A very good example of this is how the different stories are portrayed in Lord of the Rings versus Game of Thrones. Take Sauron, for instance, in Lord of the Rings. He clearly is the devil personified. And in Game of Thrones, it's more of the opposite. Most of the characters appear more grey rather than black and white. Even if a character seems evil at first, there is usually made an effort in trying to make you understand why they are acting in a certain fashion. Even if you didn't like a character like Tywin Lannister, he wasn't portrayed like Sauron, pure evil. So Lord of the Rings is definitely a Christian story and Game of Thrones more of a will to power story. That's it everyone. Here, the journey on the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche ends. I want to express big thanks if you watched all of these episodes. It's been a real pleasure in making them. Also, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't, because I got a big reveal coming up soon. So stay tuned, everybody. But until then, as always, take care. <laughs>